You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. You're taking the participant through, you know, the whole process, um, Mm -hmm. you know, where they learn how to handle a a firearm. They learn how to work behind a dog. They learn the habitat and get the experience of the bird flushing. And then, you know, how to clean that bird, because that's all great. You know, if you learn that, you know, how to shoot it and where to go, but then what? And, um, you know, so you go from, then this is how you clean a bird and go from, that's great. Here's ways that you can cook it and enjoy it too. Um, And, you know, again, when we talk about R3, the more that we can help, you know, show people how to do all of that and give them the opportunities to really try it hands on, um, you know, it's just going to further them to that point where they become self-sufficient hunters and um, feel comfortable to go out on their own and do it. Hey, y'all. About a month ago, I reached out to the Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever organization, inquiring about a Women on the Wing chapter in Montana. While back in Wisconsin, I was heavily involved in quite a few different clubs and nonprofit organizations. I've been anxious to get involved in new ones since we moved to Montana as a means to meet people and connect with others that share our passion of upland hunting and bird dogs. I got in touch with today's guest, Marissa Jensen, who is the Education and Outreach Program Manager for Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. She and Chad Harvey have been incredibly helpful with ideas and advice to get a Women on the Wing chapter started in western Montana. I asked Marissa to join me for an episode to share the process of starting a new chapter, provide info on what Women on the Wing is all about, as well as some of the other initiatives, programs, and events that Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever have to offer. And of course, I couldn't wait to ask Marissa about her start with bird dogs. And as someone who works for the organization, I knew she had some good game bird recipes to share. Okay, let's get after it. Thank you to sponsor Dakota 283, unparalleled protection for traveling to and from your favorite hunting spot. Dakota 283 kettles are a premium quality roto mold with recess handles on top for convenient and safe tie down and makes it easy to lift up into the truck. I love the secure door frame with high security lock so I know my dogs are safe when I need to stop for fuel. An added bonus is the drain hole in the back which makes cleaning a breeze when your dog has been run hard and put away wet. Head over to dakota283.com and enter promo code BIRDDOGBABE for a 10% discount through the end of June. Thank you so much, Marissa, for joining me today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Courtney. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. So a couple weeks ago, I contacted you because I was interested in starting a woman on the wing chapter here in Montana. And I thought that this would be a great idea for one of these episodes in case there are other people out there interested in either finding a chapter near them or going through this process of starting one themselves and also really what the whole initiative has to offer. So let's hop into this. I'm really excited to learn more, even <laughs> though, um, great. so Chad Harvey is the regional rep in my area here. And as I understand, he's the regional rep for Montana, Washington, and Canada. And between Correct. the two of you, you guys have sent me uh, lots of information. Chad sent me like the 88 page manual, which was a bit overwhelming (laughs) (laughs) to start a chapter. I'm like, Oh boy, I'm going to need help with this. So I hope that you can help give me a bit more condensed version. Um, so I can stay above water here as I try to get this going. (laughs) Absolutely. That's we're both here for you on that. And you guys definitely want to make it an, an easy process. So, um, yes, no, we're really excited. You know, we, we are excited to grow, um, our Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever chapters, and really excited to grow the Women on the Wing initiative as well. Great. So to start off with, what initiatives are there available within Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever? 
Yeah, so, you know, we have um, you know, several different ones. Um, we've got our legislative action fund. Um, so we have governmental affairs individuals who work really hard to advocate for wildlife and habitat. We have our No Child Left Indoors. Um, and that is an initiative that's dedicated to just working with our volunteers, chapters, and partners who share our hunting heritage um, passion along with just our you know outdoor habitat education and conservation passion um, so kind of within that um, you know our education and outreach team and programs kind of falls within that um, which obviously I'm, I'm a big part of along with my, my colleagues and so with that we have habitat education which includes like our youth pollinator habitat program um, we have our milkweed in the classroom that's designed for um, school students that want to learn about growing milkweed and helping monarchs and other pollinators. And, you know, just a handful of, you know, information there. And then we have our hunting heritage and shooting sports. And so with that is, you know, learn to hunt, learn to shoot programs, just getting people, you know, interested and helping them along the way. Um, a big term that we hear a lot within that industry and, you know, definitely through social media and other avenues now is, is R3. And so that's recruit, retain and reactivate. And, you know, nationally, we're seeing a decline in hunters. And, you know, not only does that, we're losing interest, you know, people who are interested in the outdoors and, and hunting, but it also impacts conservation funding. So it's a pretty big deal and, and we've got a big, you know, initiative to kind of grow that. And um, conservation leadership is another part of the No Child Left Indoors initiative. And Women on the Wing is kind of works alongside with our conservation leadership. But we also have our National Youth Leadership Council, who's a group of 20 to 25 high school students from across the country who are interested in conservation and are just kind of leaders in their age demographic and you know making conservation decisions and just a really pretty incredible group of kids um and so then you know leading from that we have our women on the wing initiative uh which i would love to chat with you you know more about and we have four programs that are underneath the women on the wing initiative mm -hmm. and that is our um, r3 so recruit retain and reactivate it's providing opportunities for women to learn to hunt, learn to shoot, um, meet like-minded um, individuals who are interested in that as well. We have our conservation outreach program and that's ge geared towards um, women landowners and just helping support individuals who are interested in making conservation decisions on the landscape. We have our women wine and wild game events, which are just a great opportunity for individuals to get together to um, socialize, network, you know, meet like-minded individuals, talk about conservation while enjoying wine and wild game. It's Amazing. really just a, yeah, a fun <laughs> environment. Um, who doesn't like wine and wild game? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, and then number. lastly, yeah, our women on the wing chapters, which um, we're talking about and just again, providing social support, networking with people who have similar interests, um, and just having a good time along with it. Mm -hmm. so, so lots of information I just shared. I know it was just like yeah. information dump right there. <laughs> no, no, it was, it was good. And if you don't mind, I'm probably just going to kind of pick through a little bit of each of those, um, Absolutely. as we go. Okay. So women on the wing, when, when did you guys start with this initiative? And because I attended, um, I believe it was your first kind of luncheon, um, during your convention, um, in, what was it? Schaumburg? It was near yes. Chicago. So I went yeah. to that one and that was 2008 or, uh, 19, was it 19? Correct. 19. Yep. Yeah. Uh, which was really awesome. And unfortunately I didn't make it to the one this year, but is that when it all started or was that just the first time that you guys held that, um, during Pheasant Fest? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, officially Women on the Wing launched um, kind of the end of 2018. Um, that being said, we have several individuals across the country 
um, you know, working for Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever that were hosting um, basically women on the wing events. It just, it wasn't necessarily called that and we didn't have the structure, but um, you know, from North Dakota, Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, there was just a lot of individuals that were hosting women focused um, events and just trying to increase women participation within the organization and within the, the outdoor uh, hunting industry and conservation industry. So, you know, kind of put some meat to it and guidelines to it in 2018 to launch Women on the Wing. And then uh, you got to go to the very first uh, Women Wine, or it was a Women on the Wing event luncheon at our Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic. And um, so then this past year, we had our, our Women Wine and Wild Game event in Minnesota. And uh, it, was, it was great, but uh, we definitely are planning on continuing that event or something similar to it at least every year. Um, awesome. So you can definitely plan on attending in the future too. Um, and that'll be held in conjunction with Pheasant Fest as well every year? Yes. Yep. Okay. Correct. Um, so you, so had, this... you have wine over lunch? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, yes. Absolutely. All right. I like um, these ladies. You no, know, and it'll depend. It might not always be during the lunch hour. You know, every year okay. it'll depend on the venue, you know, and, and what we're trying to accomplish as far as, um, you know, raising awareness and interest in, but there will always be some kind of component to women on the wing. And, okay. um, you know, this year we're, we'll be in South Dakota. So we're excited to kind of explore what that will look like. And, and hopefully a lot of our listeners can attend. It's, it's going to be a good time and South Dakota really likes their birds. So, uh, there's right. usually a pretty good attendance there. Yeah. And you guys have some good auction and raffle items as well. I know one of my really good friends uh, won a shotgun there last year. Excellent. So yeah, it's, it it's a lot fun. of fun. And, um, you know, we're certainly exploring with different recipes all the time too. And uh, if you haven't been to Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic, I just, I would definitely recommend it for anyone listening because it is just an incredible time. Lots of, lots of fun, lots of information. And um, yeah. yeah. And I was a little bit nervous about bringing um, my son with me. He was five and, but there is actually this huge area in the the youth area for kids. And some of the things that you guys had available there was amazing. Yeah. And I loved it. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Our, our youth village and, and actually our National Youth Leadership Council, the, the kids I were, was speaking about a little bit ago, they help run that entire youth village. Um, so they come from all across the country and just, you know, volunteer and help, you know, kids with different arts and crafts and, um, you know, learn to shoot a bow, learn to shoot a BB gun. I mean, there's just lots of really yeah. neat opportunities for kids to attend and and we want it to be a family event. We want everyone to kind of have a place there and uh, learn and have fun. Yeah, it, it was exactly that. I was really surprised. And he was able to sign up for the youth membership there as well. Oh, yes. Great. But we we really like, you know, providing opportunities for those kids. And we've got, you know, a, a great magazine for, for youth, Forever Outdoors, um, which I'm sure you guys get. So Mm-hmm. You know, and at fifteen dollars, it's it's pretty reasonable for people to you know sign their kiddos up. And I've got a ten year old, and I know that he loves to get that magazine in the mail. It's just fun for them to get something. So it's oh, yeah. definitely between <laughs> yeah between that one and the Dino magazine, it's a <laughs> it's a toss up. <laughs> well, dinos are hard to beat, so <laughs> they are they are. So that says a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. So. How many chapters are there currently of Women on the Wing? Yeah, so I think the the last we had was um, five. We've got a couple in the works. Um, So, you know, I expect that number will will grow. Um, But they function, um, you know, the same as a Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever chapter. Uh, In fact, they they are a, a Pheasants Forever or Quail Forever chapter. Um, it's just okay. kind of a, an opportunity for um, women to, you know, grow that social support, grow a network of individuals. And so um, they go about the same process, just similar to, or the same as a Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever chapter. And, and we'll identify with one of those 
And, uh, you know, some places we have both the traditional, you know, chapter with a women on the wing chapter tied to it. Sometimes they're separate, just kind of depends on what individuals are hoping to, you know, accomplish with their chapter and, and how they want to grow and how they want to connect with others and kind of leave that up to individuals to make those choices and, and work with their regional rep on that. Okay. So I'm, I'm glad you specified that because I have seen the Texas chapter, Women on the Wing chapter uh, on Instagram, and I had seen a lot of their, the logos and apparel they're wearing says, um, it's the quail forever. So Correct. that yep. that was confusing me and I wasn't sure <laughs> if there were two different women on the wing ways, but so they, they are attached to a quail forever chapter then. Mm-hmm. So they are um, a quail forever chapter and it's just a women on the wing um, opportunity within that quail forever chapter. Okay. Um, where for the listeners that are out there right now that might want to be looking for one of those five chapters, if it's near them, um, where are those? Do you know offhand? Yeah. So if they go to our pheasantsforever.org or quailforever.org, um, website, uh, you can actually find a chapter there. So it's under our participate, um, link, and then okay. it, you just type in your zip code and it'll show you where, um, you know, all your chapters are located that are nearby. Um, and then our women on the wing chapters are within that as well. But you can also go to um, our women on the wing link, which is also under that participate. And there's an entire website um, or web page, I should say, within our, our website that uh, just goes into all the details about women on the wing. Um, it gives you some different resources, how you can support and grow. One of my favorite parts about this web page is that we have an active blog on there as well. And so it is all women on the wing focused articles that we update on a monthly basis, if not uh, more than that. So it gives our listeners, you know, and people who want to be engaged with women on the wing, it gives them an opportunity to read something new that is written by a woman for women um, on a monthly basis. So definitely check nice. that out. Yeah, um, I didn't know about it's that. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. So there's one in Texas. Is there Correct. one in um, Illinois? So we don't. Uh, well, actually, yes, we do. We do have one in Illinois. Okay. Um, we have one in, actually, two in Wisconsin. Oh, okay. One in Minnesota. And I think that that is, I'm probably missing somebody. I think that that is it right now. Like I said, we've we've had a lot of conversations with new ones beginning. um, And we do have some other neat uh, opportunities within traditional chapters. We have a a woman that's uh, based out of Michigan who kind of sits on the the regular uh, traditional chapters um, committee and is a women on the wing kind of women outreach coordinator. And so what she does is she tries to increase um, women participation and involvement within their chapter um, by hosting women focused events. So there's, there's certainly lots of opportunities. Um, sometimes there's, there's just not enough individuals that maybe a, a person knows to start off with a women on the wing chapter, but maybe they know one or two people who might be interested and in, so they can you know, join a traditional chapter and work to increase women um, within that traditional chapter. So there's just, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. And, you know, that's why the regional rep and myself um, are here to kind of help find what's the best path for somebody. Um, what are they wanting? What are they looking for and how we can help them with that? Right. Are you recommending, um, when we're starting these chapters that we make it a statewide women on the wing chapter, or are you recommending that they be more of a localized area? Like, so I'm thinking for the, for Montana, for starting this one up, it's a huge state. And, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and, and and it's, so it's beneficial to be able to hold events, um, at locations that are going to appeal to everybody because they're also going to be asking them to drive seven, eight hours to come over to the, this Missoula Kalispell area. So do you, is it more, I guess maybe for smaller States? 
maybe one chapter or how do you guys recommend we do that? Yep, that's a great question. Um, so typically we have our chapters um, on like a county basis, um, depending on what the presence is in that state for chapters, you know, they can certainly be larger than just a county. Um, that usually, you know, is a, a, the regional representative will really help um, those chapters with those decisions. And, you know, sometimes there's another chapter in a different county where you can kind of host an event together um, or work together when you have a long distance between chapters like you're, you're referring to, um, just so that you can host events in different areas to get more awareness and get more participation. So it really kind of depends, you know, state by state um, on what exists in that state for chapters already and, you know, interest levels. And that's where we, we really try and work with individuals, um, you know, on their own personal experiences and on an individual basis to try and help them out with that. Okay. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to attend the Pheasants Forever banquet here in Missoula. It was, gosh, like literally a week before everything shut down. Um, sure. so it was nice to know, and it, it looks like this, this local one is very active and because I had just moved to the area, I don't know anybody yet. So building interest is going to be maybe a bit more difficult for me because I don't have that connection with a lot of the women in the area that might be interested in it. Sure. So what are some recommendations on how to reach, um, interest for this? Absolutely. So, you know, that's definitely something that we can help out with as well. Um, you know, myself for Women on the Wing, and we have a, a great work group of, of women across the country that we can connect people with based on, you know, their location. Regional reps, again, they're, they're really the biggest, um, you know, support and, um, you know, just guidance for chapters. And so they can help with that. Existing chapters can certainly help with it as well, um, depending on, you know, what, what their resources are. And, you know, sometimes a, a social event, we've had a lot of individuals start Women on the Wing chapters or, you know, just growing Women on the Wing um, within traditional chapters by hosting a Women, Wine, and Wild Beam event or hosting, okay. you know, an R3 event. And so, so you don't have to be an established chapter in order to hold those events then? Yeah, so you can work with um, your regional representatives, you know, to, to potentially hold one of those Women, Wine, and Wild Game events um, as kind of a, a chapter start. Uh, you can also work with existing chapters and, you know, individuals to host some of those events. Um, so it just kind of depends on you know, what event you want to host, how you want to go about the chapter and and we work with you guys on that um, to kind of help okay. gain awareness and interest in what you're trying to accomplish. So, yeah, there's definitely ways to, uh, you know, kind of kick it off with one of those. Mm -hmm. So what does a typical um, event like that look like for the Women, Wine, and Wild Game? Does a, a rep comes in for that? So they sometimes can, um, you know, the, like I said, they're one of our, our best resources for um, for chapters. And so they like to be involved and support and help as much as they can. Uh, but really, you know, they're, a lot of people are familiar with a pint night. Um, so, you know, it's a, an opportunity for people to get together, to drink, to eat, to just socialize. Um, right. Very laid back atmosphere. And I would say women, wine, and wild game, you know, kind of have that same feel to them. It's, you know, just an opportunity for people to get to know one another, to have fun. Maybe they haven't, you know, had wild game before. They've never hunted, but they're interested in learning. And so it's a great opportunity to try some different recipes and see what they think. Um, you know, some people just want to meet other outdoor enthusiasts. And so it's an opportunity to meet some people in the area. Um, similar to what you were saying, you're new. Um, you know, what better way than, you know, hosting or, you know, participating in an event like this, where you can meet some other individuals who like the same things that you do, uh, you know, and different, they have different themes. Sometimes it's, you know, to talk about conservation, how it's funded, how hunters are 
participating in that and, and helping with conservation funding. Sometimes it's to start a Women on the Wing chapter. Um, other times they're utilized as fundraisers. So there's a, there's a lot of different themes um, that they can kind of take on, but ultimately it's you know creating social support and networking and, and just really getting individuals together to um, kind of share their common goal. Mm -hmm. So would it be a similar setup to a, what we have seen at the regular Pheasants Forever or Quail Forever banquets where there's raffles and auctions at these events as well? Sure. Um, you know, they certainly can. I would say that there are um, different in the sense that they're usually smaller. And a lot of times they don't necessarily have that auction or raffle component to them. Um, okay. It's not that they can't, they, they certainly can, um, but they're a little bit more casual, laid back, um, and just more of a get together than a kind of formal banquet, um, if that makes sense. Yep, it does. And so if, so since this will be going off the, our local Pheasants Forever chapter, is it going to be a separate membership for people? Nope, that's a great question as well. So it'll still go under a Pheasants Forever or Quail Forever membership. Um, so, you know, Women on the Wing is just an in, in, in it, ooh, I can't talk, initiative <laughs> within that, um, but it's still directly tied to um, our organization. So the membership would be with one of those. Okay. And so it's still a separate chapter, but it's with the local one, right? For the, for women on the wing? Yeah. Or would yeah, it so, be, or, or how would I call that? So, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of the name of, <laughs> of the chapter here that is in Missoula. Um, yeah. So when, so for instance, that chapter would be, you know, when you, when you get a membership, you're still getting a, a pheasants forever or a quail forever membership. Um, and the same with the women on the wing chapter, you're still getting a, a pheasants forever or a quail forever membership. Um, and then you are just, you know, a part of that chapter, but mm -hmm. it is still, you know, for, for all the chapters across the country, um, you're still getting just, uh, you know, a, a Pheasants Forever or Quail Forever or both uh, membership um, ultimately. So it just is that overarching, um, you know, organization within those chapters. Okay. All right. Um, and then as far as some of the, I'm sorry. See, now I can't talk. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's contagious. Initiatives and <laughs> objectives. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Some of the objectives for this chapter um, mm -hmm. are mainly to raise the money for mm -hmm. conservation. So when we raise that and hold um, these events and banquets, what percentage of that can we expect to be able to um, use towards conservation? Yeah, that's, that's a great question as well. Um, so our, our chapter model is, is fairly different than other organizations where, um, you know, we have a grassroots model and when chapters raise money, um, they get to decide where that, where those dollars are spent a hundred percent of them. So, awesome. you know, yeah. Wow. Um, it, and, you know, I would say that the biggest goal with our chapters is to, you know, allow them to make conservation decisions on the landscape. And they're able to do that on a local level. They're able to donate to national initiatives like the ones we talked about earlier. So it, it gives them the opportunity to decide how they want to contribute to conservation, where they want to contrib contribute to conservation. And, you know, we, there, it, it impacts conservation and habitat, um, you know, wherever they're at and wherever they're spending those dollars. And so, um, it just really gives them those opportunities to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. And 100% because you're right, that is unheard of. Um, I, I was a president of a chapter uh, back in Wisconsin of a different organization. And we were able to put uh, money raised towards starting archery in a local high school. Sure. Um, so just stuff like that is is very, 
it's just nice to be able to get it going because yeah. I know when I was in high school, we didn't have anything like that. And the shooting sports, I know it's a big competitive thing now in schools. Yes. And to be able to give them that opportunity is very cool. Yeah, absolutely. What about, so some of the other chapters that are going right now, where, what are some things that, that they're doing where they're spending their money? Yeah. Um, so it definitely depends on the chapter in the state. Um, you know, we have some chapters who are a little bit more urban focused, um, you know, so they may look at things a little differently than some of the rural community communities where, you know, they can make really big, um, you know, landscape acre decisions. Um, so it just kind of depends. A lot of individuals like to host like our, our learn to hunt events um, with kids. So they'll do that on an annual basis. Um, we have the Youth Pollinator Habitat Program. So they'll, you know, get a bunch of students together and, um, you know, plant pollinator plots and just get involved with the community. And I think that that's, you know, what individuals enjoy the most about it is just that connection with the community, um, teaching others about conservation, you know, making decisions where, you know, they can help other landowners, they can help, um, you know, state agencies and things like that with, you know, conservation decisions and um, setting aside land. And there's just a lot of really great opportunities. So, but I would say that, you know, a lot of them really like to connect with youth. That's a big one. Um, right. And just, you know, getting involved with the youth in their community. Mm -hmm. So with that, and because you hold... Uh, from what I understand, similar, um, and that's kind of goes into your R3, right? When you're doing, yeah. when you're doing the youth, but you also use that forum throughout the women's R3 as well, because you, mm -hmm. there's learn to hunt events with women. Is it possible to hold one that is for both youth and women together? Yeah. So, um, I mean, we recognize that there's, you know, that, that decline in hunter numbers is, is a national concern and there is a national R3 initiative, um, you know, that's outside of our organization. It's just with, you know, all um, outdoor enthusiasts or, you know, with right. hunting are concerned about this. So um, there's a lot of efforts in place to, you know, just gain interest and get people excited about it. And so, um, you know, we have specific learn to hunt adult events. We have, um, youth mentor hunt events for the kids. We've got, you know, women on the wing events. So it's really just depending on what an individual wants to host for an event. There doesn't need to be um, a focus on age, you know, or, or gender. Um, it can just be open to anyone or, you know, to streamline things. They can, you know, make it a, an adult event, make it a women's focused event, make it a youth event. Um, the options are, are endless on that. Um, so it's just whatever they prefer and, and whatever works best for what they have in their community to work with. Okay. So what kind, what does that look like? And I guess what kind of support does, would Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever in general um, offer to that event? Like, do they provide shells or guns or are members within the chapter bringing those things like a shooting instructor? Yeah. What can we expect so, from that? Definitely. Um, the regional representatives really help with those individuals. We have district meetings every year um, that happen in the state. And so the regional representatives kind of go over all the different programs that the organization has, um, what's, you know, different opportunities within like banquets and, um, you know, utilizing different equipment. Um, but ultimately I think that's, you know, one of the things that they can use some of the dollars they've raised on to help host some of these events. And, you know, we have a lot of great partners with state agencies where, you know, sometimes for instance, in Nebraska, um, which is where I live, we have our Nebraska Game and Parks Commission who works very closely with Pheasants Forever in the state to host youth men or hunt events. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of kind of combined resources there where uh, we can provide support for chapters to grow these events. Um, and so it kind of just depends on the state, what resources they have, 
um, who they want to partner with. Um, but there's a lot of different opportunities to make sure that these events are put together well and um, that there's enough resources for all the kids. Okay. Um, and I read in part of your, the R3 that um, another option is to have public land hunting days. Mm -hmm. What does that kind of look like? Yeah, so North Dakota kicked that off a little bit um, where basically they get together towards the end of the season and just invite individuals from across the state to meet up, meet one another, and just kind of go out and, and hunt together. It's, it's very casual, pretty unstructured, um, just an opportunity to meet individuals and hunt some new land that maybe that they haven't hunted before and just promoting public access in the area. Cool. That's very yeah. neat. Yes. What about the um, Cast and Blast event? Yeah. So um, I was pretty heavily involved with that one in Nebraska, and we've had some other states host those events. And um, just a, it was just a fun time. Um, and really what we're learning is that when you have events that are more than just one day, you're helping the individual that's there go from an introduction to it to a point where they're really starting to learn some of the skills a little bit deeper and get to practice them a little bit longer. And it also allows them a couple days to really connect with the individuals that they're at the event with. Um, we, we recognize that social support is one of the biggest contributors to helping somebody go from um, the recruitment phase of R3 to the retention phase. Um, they need somebody that can kind of help them through that process as they learn. And so we're learning that these multi-day events are helping provide that social support. So mm -hmm. with this particular event, it was held over a weekend and we camped and it was um, on public land that we hunted and camped. And you know we tied flies with bird feathers, we fished, we hunted, we cooked oh, cool. over the campfire. Yeah, I mean, it just was, it was a great time and, you know, we were from all across the state, but we actually all ended up going out on a hunt um, late season in Nebraska where, you know, we got the group back together and went out on public land and, and just had fun. It wasn't an event. It was just us, you know, kind of new friendships that were being built through that event, uh, previous event that just wanted to get together and hunt again. So it was really exciting to see, you know, the transformation between some of those individuals from that first event to, you know, a couple months later. And, and one of the young ladies that attended um, went on and harvested her first deer, her first waterfowl. I mean, she's just, oh, wow. she got bit by the bug and took it, you know, to, to a lot of you know, new awesome. lengths. So it was really exciting to see. Right. When we're looking to hold these events, so I'm really fortunate. I met a woman that uh, up in Kalispell that just opened a shooting sports business, Excel Shooting Sports, and she's a woman entrepreneur, just opened her doors a couple weeks ago, and she has this amazing demo facility where people can come and try out. She has line the Cesar Guarini fab arm and the women's siren shotgun line. Yeah. And so, I mean, the place is absolutely amazing, and she has offered – um, for us to be able to hold some events at her place. Sure. And the, the nice thing about it is um, she also offered our NABDA chapter to come do some um, training and stuff there. So we have the opportunity to do, to have a great facility for that, but we're also looking at having a second option here in Missoula. And I'm trying to think, you know, where would be an ideal place to hold an event where are you seeing are people opening up their homes to have the women wine and wild game or are they renting out a facility are they getting a banquet room at a restaurant or i guess you probably can't bring in your own game to most restaurants but what is, <laughs> <laughs> what is um what are some recommendations there on ideal places to hold an event yeah so it, you know it definitely depends on the type of event um you know we Again, like partners are fantastic. We've got a lot of really great partners and individuals that will help us. You mentioned NAVDA, um, great partner that we just love to work with. Um, 
And, and so, you know, kind of combining resources can help some restaurants, um, you know, and, and bars and grills and things like that are, are good places to host some of these events. Um, a lot of times they'll have like a, a spare room that you can rent out um, specifically for events like this, where it gives you a little bit more of an intimate environment. It's not so loud with people coming in and out um, that, you know, tend to be good. Um, vineyards are another good place. And so it just kind of depends mm -hmm. on what the facility looks like. Um, trying to keep it a little bit intimate so that it's, again, people can hear you and they can talk and it's not loud with individuals coming in and out. Um, mm -hmm. we, we have a guide and it's on our resource page on the Women on the Wing um, site, as well as, you know, something that we provide to chapters and volunteers, but kind of goes into how to host one of these events. Um, because one of the things that you mentioned is a, is a really good, um, you know, topic is, you know, the wild game component. And, um, you know, making sure that you're following guidelines, um, you know, with your state on that as far as, you know, whether you purchase it from like a farm, if it's a farm raised bird um, versus, you know, wild game, um, which you cannot charge for. So, you know, just working with your regional representative and your state regulations on some of those things um, will be helpful as well as you kind of prepare for one of these events. Okay. Well, it, so my thought for our initial event was um, to hold it up at that facility in Kalispell where we yeah. can kind of have a do it all. And you're, I guess you're going to have to let me know if this is going to be allowed in maybe, or I check into the Montana rules more, but if we would be able to do kind of an entire demo of putting um, some birds on the ground and having dogs out, do a little set up hunt, I guess, similar mm -hmm. to what you would see at a game farm and, and then go through the process of cleaning birds. Um, mm -hmm. and then taking those harvested birds and using those as our, um, game birds for the recipes we use for that later on that afternoon. Yeah. I, I think events like that are so unique and special and great because you're taking the participant through you know, the whole process, um, mm -hmm. you know, where they learn how to handle a, a firearm, they learn how to work behind a dog, they, you know, learn the habitat and get the experience of the bird flushing. And then, you know, how to clean that bird, because that's all great. You know, if you learn that, you know, how to shoot it and where to go, but then what? And, right. um, you know, so you go from then this is how you clean a bird and go from that's great. Here's ways that you can cook it and enjoy it too. Um, and, you know, again, when we talk about R3, the more that we can help, you know, show people how to do all of that and give them the opportunities to really try it hands on, um, you know, it's just going to further them to that point where they become self-sufficient hunters and um, feel comfortable to go out on their own and do it. So mm -hmm. um, I think right. those are great events. And yeah, I mean, every state's a little bit different as far as, um, you know, consuming the game and charging with it. So that's the biggest thing to just check on. But, um, but otherwise, no, those are, those are perfect events and, and we love to see stuff okay. like that. Yeah. And well, it's a good way to get our, our NAVDA chapter involved as well, because I know um, the dogs, a lot of the dogs could use the work and mm -hmm. um, there are several women in my local NAVDA chapter here and um, to be able to get them out and get their dogs in the field and then go through the whole process. Yeah, so, absolutely. And dogs are a big motivator for, you know, new hunters. Um, you know, when we ask absolutely. people why they started upland hunting, um, bird dogs are a pretty big contributor to that. So, um, you know, I think that's a neat opportunity for people to see, you know, how different breeds work and, and NAVDA has, um, you know, such a, a resource for individuals that, um, you know, we just, we just love working with them and um, their dog handlers are just fantastic. Right. Okay. Marissa, you just kind of gave me a bridge there to be able to <laughs> talk about your experience and how you got started. Yeah. So, so I, do you uh, have a bird dog? I do. I actually have two now. Um, oh. The, <laughs> the newest one just joined me Oh, about six or seven months ago, she just turned a year old. 
Um, what do you so got? I have German, German short hair pointers. Okay. Um, which is kind of funny in itself. Um, I, uh, I was a vet tech for about 10 years and um, had a, a German short hair pointer mix as my very first dog ever on my own. And uh, why I loved him very much, he was, he was awful. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, you know, I, I, I had formed an opinion about German short hair pointers. And uh, I can tell you, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I would never, ever think that I would own two of them now. And, mm-hmm. you know, decide that that was my, my breed of choice for a bird dog. But um, I love my dogs. Um, they're, they're very different. My, my older one, Reese, um, came from a woman out of Missouri. And she, uh, she's actually, um, I got her as an adult. She had a previous owner and it just didn't work out. And so um, I t- took her in and she's just completely changed my opinion of the breed. Um, she's, she's great in the field. She works really hard. She's got an incredible nose and just gives it 120%. But then when she's at home, she's just a giant couch potato <laughs> and, um, it just has an incredible off switch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, you know, it really changed my opinion and, you know, I've talked to the, the breeder that where she came from pretty frequently and, you know, the way that she, with her dogs, um, Reese, my, my pointer is a little bit on the higher energy for what she likes to breed. And so it's like, wow, that's, I'll never, <laughs> never go to another breeder if that's the case, because she's perfect. Um, and then the second one was, was a little bit more of a rescue situation. Um, just ended up, you know, with a, an owner that wasn't a good fit and he couldn't find her a home. And, um, you know, just kind of on a last straw scenario. And so I took her in and was just going to foster and find her a home and uh, she just never left. So typical. she's, she's, yeah, <laughs> she's got some different issues to work out. She's got pretty serious separation anxiety, but um, sure, she is a ton of fun. We, we have a, an annual uh, event called the rooster road trip. And that's part of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. And we were lucky enough to join this last year. And Mm -hmm. Yeti, the the puppy, is, I had just gotten her. And so she got to tag along just for socialization and fun. And I did get the opportunity to take her out and let her hunt on her own a little bit in the evenings. And uh, she's going to be a lot of fun this year. I'm excited to to add her. Yeah, she's going to be fun. So Very Um, cool. Are yeah. you, are you involved in your local NAVDA chapter at all? Yeah. So I, I actually just started conversations with the chapter, um, last year and I was so excited to start Yeti with them this year. Um, cause I mm-hmm. trained them both for waterfowl as well. Uh, and fortunately COVID has kind of changed our plans a little bit on engaging with them, but, uh, right. the, once, once we are, able to start kind of getting together and, and joining them. That is the plan. Um, I'm really excited to kind of connect with this chapter. Um, it's the Heartland oh. chapter. So it's kind of a combination oh, of Iowa great and chapter. Nebraska. Yes, yeah, yeah. They're so really good. I can't wait to finally start, you know, training with them and get to know them more and hopefully soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Yes. I think the next couple of months here, um, Oh, good. You're going to be in amazing hands then. And that's, that's something I love about the organization. And when we have puppies, I just, you know, we, we tell everybody we to join their local NAVDA chapter mm-hmm. because I know anywhere in the U S where one of our puppies go, that they're going to be involved right away in a supportive system that just wants to see them and their dog succeed. And Absolutely. I don't know any other organization or club that can, that provides that it's a non-competitive venue. So it, everybody's helpful. It's, it's amazing. I can't say yeah. about it. So good. I'm a gl- glad you're going to be able to get to see that and participate in that. Yeah. I, you know, it's, I live in a, in a pretty big, I live in the largest city in Nebraska. And so when you think about, you know, resources, you know, access to birds and lands and things like that, like there's really not a lot of opportunities unless you know someone where you can go or, you know, if you can find a chapter, that's a huge resource. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah. We're excited. 
Good. I'm speaking for my dogs when I say we're excited. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. And you have a you have a 10 year old, you said? I do, yes. He'll be 11 Fun. here in a couple months. Aww. Does he like to go with you? He does. You know, he hasn't, um, he's kind of been a little bit slow on the interest to hunting and you know, some of that is I, I actually, Oh, I'm trying to think now if this is my, I think this is my fourth year hunting, um, fourth or fifth, but I'm, I'm a very relatively new hunter. Um, sure. so when I started, you know, he was already a little bit older. It's not like I was hunting when he was born and he grew up around that. Um, <laughs> my first, my first hunt was actually with a turkey and I remember he'll, I won't, I can't let him listen to this because he'll be so mad. I shared the story, but <laughs> <laughs> he, um, when I went, um, he was so mad when I, when I showed up, he wouldn't talk to me for like a day and a half because I, I killed a turkey and he was so mad at oh, me. No. <laughs> oh no. Yes. We've come a long way since then. Um, you know, he definitely, you guys, I'm sorry. You were successful no, okay. on your very first turkey hunt. <laughs> I was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It oh was, my gosh. It was, I'm so, it was such a I'm cool so hunt jealous. too. Oh, well, it was, I mean, the total, we were about to give up. We were, we said 30 more minutes and then we're leaving because we just hadn't had any luck. And, you know, right. I think the last 10 minutes before we were kind of already starting to pack up our stuff a little bit. And he came in and it was just this, back and forth, you know, he almost walked away, then he came back, then he walked away and he was strutting and fanned out. And so I could not ask for a better first time. I mean, it had all of the ups and downs and excitement. Awesome. And, oh, it was, it was incredible. So I was, I was very spoiled. Amazing. That. You are so lucky. I, oh my gosh, I can't even tell you. I've had turkeys walking around the, our front yard since we moved here in September. Oh my goodness. And then season starts. And they all go away. Yep. Yep. They just completely ghost you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. My theory is turkeys are dicks. That's yeah. my theory. <laughs> I just, I'm so annoyed. <laughs> oh, they're, they're very smart. They're they smart, are. not smart in the same sense. And oh, they just, but I yeah. think that's just what makes it fun. You know, and I, and I've told my son, you're that right. He's, he's come along now for a couple turkey hunts. Um, we've tried to get him a bird and you know, he gets frustrated and I, I I tell him, if you knew you were going to get a bird every time that you came and sat down in a blind, would you enjoy it as much? Um, and I don't think you would. I mean, certainly on the days where you get skunked multiple days in a row, it's like, yeah, I would. I would absolutely enjoy that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, I think it, it just wouldn't be as exciting. So I, I try and keep that in perspective. Uh, yeah. But it's certainly... It can be it'll come. <laughs> yeah, yes. it'll come. So now he, so now he's not upset about you going turkey hunting anymore if he's with you. Yes, correct. So that's and good. <laughs> he loves to eat wild game. Um, I think that that's the biggest draw for him is the food part of it, and and that was ultimately, um, I think, what led me to start too was the the food component. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's even, um, gotten involved with helping me cook the meat. Um, you know, I don't think there's been a wild game that he's tried that he hasn't liked. Uh, and he's become a little bit of a food critic. He keeps a, he keeps Ooh. a wild game journal. And I, I looked at, you know, one day and he made the comment that uh, my quail was good, but it needed more salt. And so it's kind of been this running joke that he's going to be the, the chef because I can't cook. And <laughs> <laughs> It's been I love a it. lot of fun. Yeah. I love it. So, so you, being with the organization that you work for, you probably know a ton of amazing recipes. Tell me, what is your favorite way to prepare a uh, pheasant and your favorite recipe? That's a, that's a tough question. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, there's so many good ways. You know, I, uh, I have to be honest I love pheasant and I love quail, but prairie grouse is probably my favorite upland bird. Heck um, yes, it is. And yeah, I'm so glad you just said that because <laughs> it gets such yeah. a bad rap. And, you know, I remember when I told somebody that I, and, and I just love prairie grouse hunting. I love, yeah. the I love all grouse. grouse. Yeah. And it's just such a different type of hunting and, and you really let the dogs range out and, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, 
I gotta say that's my favorite. And I was told when I went hunting the first time for prairie chicken, you know, oh, it's liver on wings and they're disgusting. And uh, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't listen. And so if anybody's ever heard that before, don't listen. They're delicious. Um, it's a dark. So how do you so how do you make them? You know, we did a I'm trying to remember what it was called, but we did kind of a um, like a stir fry with them and pan just pan seared them. Okay. And um, kind of kept it a little bit more, um, you know, you definitely don't want to overdo it. And so I really liked that. I think with pheasant and quail, you know, we've done different recipes like pheasant pot pie. And, um, you know, we've done just where we pan fry them and, and you know, just ate them pretty plain like that. Um, you know, recently we did a blog on our um, pheasants forever and quail forever page. Uh, Bob St. Pierre, our vice president of marketing and communications, has this, this recipe. And, you know, I used to just laugh when I would see it because it sounds disgusting. <laughs> it's a blueberry and pesto pizza with wild game. And he's used mm. um, historically rough grouse because he lives in Minnesota and um, they do a lot of rough grouse hunting. And so we we recreated that. And I was like, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. I'll give it the benefit of the doubt and, you know, blueberries and pesto and pizza with game and, uh, and it was probably one of the best things I've had in a long time um, Interesting. we just recently made it you know kind of in in combination with the blog and you know between just my son and myself we ate the entire pizza in one sitting <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> too funny it so, must have been good Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, Do you have so that recipe on your blog? Is that what you said? It is on our blog. So if you okay. go to pheasantsforever.org or quailforever.org, you will see it on our blog. And okay. it's got a really fun game with it too. Um, it's it's a pollinator game. And so it's it's a good way to um, cook with the family or, you know, cook by yourself. It doesn't have to be with kids. It's, you know, very appropriate for adults too to play. And mm -hmm. it's just um, figuring out how much of an impact pollinators make on the food that we eat. Um, and so if you didn't have pollinators, what ingredients for this recipe would not be available? And mm. it's, it's pretty eye-opening. So it's a fun activity, great recipe, cool. delicious pizza, highly recommend it. Okay. Gonna have to give it a try. <laughs> it sounds, you're right. It sounds really bizarre though. And who would it even does. think of putting any of those, like the pesto and blueberries? I know. On I a, know. On a pizza. I'm right there with you. I just, you know, he, he had posted the recipe um, probably a year, year and a half prior to us putting this out. And I was like, I don't know, Bob. That's, that's pretty gross. <laughs> <laughs> And I just, you know, I sent him a message the day that we cooked it. And I was like, wow, I, uh, I will never doubt you again. Wow. <laughs> yeah, That's cool. So, Definitely. How about to you? Find what's, that your, one. what's your favorite way? I like to wrap anything in bacon. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, it, and just put them on the grill. Um, that's, that's my favorite. Yeah. It just, I feel like I can't go wrong. So Sometimes um, put them on a bed of rice. Yes. And I think mm -hmm. those are, those are good, like introductories too, if somebody's not sure. Um, yeah. and that was what I did with my first pheasant. And if you like ranch, what I did is I put, um, that, that dry ranch rub and I rolled the pheasant meat in that and then stuffed it in pepperoncinis and wrapped that in bacon. And Ooh. that was really good. So if you, if you like a, just a tiny bit of heat and then like the ranch flavor, that was one of my right. favorite recipes that I kind of forgot about until now. So I'm glad you brought okay. that up. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Gosh, I'm going to have to thaw out some pheasant now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, what do you shoot with? What, what gun? Yeah. So I actually, I've got a, <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you think about it. Um, <laughs> I have so far gotten a shotgun for every year that I've hunted and not intentionally. It's just kind of happened that way. Um, but my very, my very first gun was a Franke affinity 20 gauge, Ooh. um, which I love. It's kind of my start now big. Yeah. Go to use for everything. You know, I waterfowl hunt, turkey hunt, mm -hmm. upland hunt with it. Um, but then I, I just, I love break action shotguns. I love the way right. they look. I love the tradition behind them. And then, you know, when I was talking about prairie grouse hunting, um, 
you know, there's been days where we put 10 miles in one day. And so, you know, being able to open that gun and, and put it over my shoulder is really helpful when we're putting on miles like that and you're just exhausted. Um, so I actually just got a new shotgun. Um, it's a CZ um, side by side. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the uh, sharp tail and I love it. Um, it fits me perfectly. I took it out, finally got to shoot it for the first time in January. And the very first time, you know, I, I hunted with it, you know, I was able to um, shoot a couple quail. So it just was, it was a perfect fit. And I'm nice. really looking forward to taking that in the sand hills this year too. Cool. Yeah. So there's great guns out there. <laughs> there are, there are. Yeah. And that's why I'm always intrigued in asking the question because I like to know, um, what all these badass ladies are shooting with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As, you know, I, I really, so different. yeah, there's a lot of great guns. Um, you know, it's the best advice is to try on, you know, to, to be able to shoulder them. Um, you know, if you, if you can get one fitted, that's even better. And, you know, I didn't understand that in the beginning until I, you know, had one that just fit me really well, like the sharp tail. And, um, it's, pretty significant the difference when when you can pull up and just connect like that right away mm -hmm. absolutely yeah I can't say how many times I've had um, my previous one stuck in my armpit coming up and you, know, <laughs> you, <laughs> you get two Real? seconds so it's it's really annoying especially oh, yes. when you're wearing the vest and the bulky winter gear um so yeah, that's, a thing. I, I remember when I first started shooting, I was doing it completely wrong. And I, you know, I went to the range and I had these bruises on my upper arm. I'm like, I don't think that's where the bruises are supposed to be. Right. <laughs> no, I don't think that's same, accurate. <laughs> yeah. Same thing. Same yeah. thing. And my, my husband actually pointed out, he's like, what happened to your arm? I go, what are you talking about? Oh, I guess yeah. I don't know. He said, is that where you're <laughs> shooting from? Oh. <laughs> Dang it. You must yeah. be. You just yeah. don't realize it. Do you? You don't, and, you don't. Yeah. So, I mean, if there's an opportunity to find someone to shoot with and to get some coaching, it, it's definitely worth it too, especially oh, before sure. you develop those bad habits. Cause then it's hard to break. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, um, I'm really fortunate. I just met that person that's helping me. Um, he's in my NAVDA chapter and we're, we've been doing Wednesdays until this happened, but I'm, I'm really excited to hunt this fall now that I actually yeah. have a clue of what I'm doing and he gives me homework and this is what I should be doing at home. And, and I finally got a different gun that fits me yes. so, so well. So there's so much difference. And I think my dogs are going to be much happier with me this season <laughs> than ever before. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. When I, when I first got Reese, um, you know, because she had a previous owner and, and her, you know, breeder is a trainer and, um, you know, she'd done some hunt tests. So when I would shoot, she would instantly run off and start looking for the bird. And I was a terrible shot. And I'm still not great, but I was a terrible shot. <laughs> and so now I laugh because I shoot and she just keeps hunting. And it's like, wait, no, I actually shot a bird this time. We have to go away. <laughs> so I, I love I, it. I've basically <laughs> untrained her. And <laughs> I'm so sorry. I promised to make that up. <laughs> She's like, oh, my, my mom just likes to shoot in the air. So I'm just yeah. going to continue hunting. <laughs> yep. I'll keep finding birds that she won't shoot. So I love it. Well, I've, I've had a dog actually turn around and bark at me for missing his third bird. So, <laughs> oh no. So girl, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's all right. We all have to start somewhere. And even then, even, you know, years down the road, it still happens. And that's, that's okay. That's normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So oh, it's funny. Yes. Too funny. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. This has been a really fun conversation. Um, I learned yeah. quite a bit and I hope I don't have to page through the 88 um, <laughs> page <laughs> manual here because I know Perfect. so much more. Absolutely. And I'll just, I'll just start giving Chad a call and, and just asking him specifics. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, just to kind of reiterate, that's, you know, we're, we're here to help and we're here to answer questions and, um, regional yeah. representatives are just a wealth of knowledge and a great resource and help and, you know, women on the wing, um, you know, definitely reach out to me. And like I said, we've got regional resources as well um, for women on the wing. So, you know, never feel like you can't reach out and ask someone for help. That's what we're here for. We're, we're excited to, to grow um, participants. We're excited to grow, you know, resources and conservational 
all across the country. So um, don't hesitate to ask. Right. And I think, you know, even though we talked today about um, women and kids programs, there are a lot of guys out there that um, are going through the same thing that you and I have where we, we got the dog and now we want to start hunting with them. Yep. So um, same, same things for them, right? You guys, absolutely. you learn to hunt and your wing shooting stuff and the cast and blast, all that the guys are invited to. Absolutely. We just, we just want more people to be excited about the places that we love and mm -hmm. the places that we want to, you know, keep around. So um, the more the merrier and uh, we've got opportunities for everyone. Perfect. Thanks, Marissa. This was awesome. Thank you so I much, appreciate your Courtney. time today. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to see women on the wing grow with you. Yeah, it'll be good. So anybody that's in, in the Montana I should say Western Montana area, <laughs> <laughs> keep it a little bit more condensed here. Um, shoot me an email, give me a call because we are in the works of starting something really awesome here. I'm excited. Thanks for listening to another episode of the bird dog babe podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something from the content, please share it with your friends. Please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on whichever platform you're listening from. Check out the show notes for links to references from this episode, as well as info on how to connect through Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you're loving this podcast and want to support the production and content, please consider becoming one of my Patreon patrons. Being a patron connects us more on a personal level where I'm able to help answer questions and give advice. My husband William and I have bred, owned, and trained AKC Master Hunters, Field Champions, NAVDA VCs, and AKC Show Champions. We're excited to not only share what we've learned, but also listen from previous and future episode guests for additional content. Go to patreon.com backslash the bird dog babe and $5 per month and you're in. And as always, 2% goes to conservation. Until next week, bird dog babes, keep them versatile. <laughs>